Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This week on the Sweetwater Minute, we are joined by Clint Ward from Apogee. Thanks for coming in, my friend. Yes, Good to, to see you. Yeah, Appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been looking today at Apogee's flagship product, yes. the Symphony I.O. Correct. Can you give us just a brief rundown on what this product is? Well, again, this is Apogee's um, flagship um, converters, and uh, of course, that's 25 years of experience, 25 years of product from uh, a company that is very well known for really good converters. Right. Um, and uh, it's probably the bravest uh, of the products to date um, for a bunch of reasons. Right. Um, first and foremost, um, it sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the reasons it sounds fantastic is it's definitely utilizing the most modern components possible. Um, in fact, uh, Apogee actually prides themselves and the engineers pride themselves on the fact that they do go out and really source out uh, what is uh, the cutting edge components um, that are going to make great converters. Right. Uh, and it's not just the converter, of course. We also, uh, you know, have found out when I talked to the engineers that the converter is just the first piece. Mm -hmm. And really, once you have the converter, the um, analog section that you make around that, which, you know, compromises a power supply that has to be really good, a really good clock, plus right. the analog section, and it's the sum of these parts that creates great sound and great performing converters. And uh, mm -hmm. by far, this is the most modern interface that Apogee has ever designed because, um, you know, and, and kind of funny enough, when we talk about this, it's one of the specific reasons when you actually look at the circuit board that, um, you know, these are smaller than older parts. Right. And because they're smaller and more power efficient, um, Apogee was able to put a lot of analog on one card. Mm -hmm. And specifically, this is why the 16 by 16 analog card actually exists on a form factor this size. Right. Right. So we've kind of jumped ahead just a little bit. Yeah. So what we've got here is, uh, just to clarify, yeah. we've got the converter of the interface, which is the overall unit. Yeah. But you were talking also about the converter, which is the chip inside that actually changes the analog signal into the digital signal. Yeah. And the circuit that surrounds that, and one of the things we were talking about earlier is that's what really differentiates what Apogee does. Is is any company can get the same converter yes. chip, but it's the analog circuitry and the power supply and the clocking that you surround that chip with that really results in a product like this. Exactly, and that is the artistry in the design phase, mm -hmm. right? I mean, really, that's the artistry, and that's where the 25 years of experience comes in. Is that these guys are true artists when they're designing these pathways, and they're very meticulous in this. And that that really the end product with that is just great sound, right. great conversion, great great sound. Right? right. So what the Symphony I.O. really does is it's kind of the base unit. Yep. So when you purchase this, this is what connects to your computer, you plug it into the wall, mm -hmm. but in order to get signal in and out of it, you use these cards. That's correct. That and you that's, were showing earlier. And that's the second thing that's amazing about this box is that, um, you know, when we look at the modern studio and, uh, you know, these things are pretty big investments, mm -hmm. um, obsolescence in this day and age is a very important thing, you know, and, and when you're looking at something and if you spend a lot of money on a very important component of your studio and then you've got to switch it out a couple years later. So one of the other um, foundations of the design was it to be modular, uh -huh. right? So the modularity of this was very uh, purposeful, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when you buy the chassis, which is the box, right, it comes with all the components to get connectivity, but you have two empty slots. Um, and we have a wide range of analog cards that can go in that slot from the most basic, which is our 8x8, mm -hmm. right? And then we have uh, a 16 in. We also have a 16 out, right? And now we have the 16 by 16 analog. Okay. Plus we have a preamp card, right? So when you take these and the, all the possible permutations, you can really cover a lot of bases. So what, you know, and that's really kind of cool because then you can build this specifically to your needs. Right. right? So if you only need 8 in and 8 outs, great. If, if you're actually doing mobile recording, the preamp might be a great choice, mm -hmm. right? So the modular aspect, this was very much on purpose to create a certain future-proofness, right? So right. in the future, if you want to change your system or buy another chassis and, and then switch out the cards, you can, mm -hmm. right? But then inversely, if the connectivity standards, right, in the future change, well, then the chassis itself could be modified, right? Okay. Or we could develop new chassis that then your analog cards could go in. So the okay. modularity of the product is quite, is quite, uh, quite brave. And uh, it's really at a mature state right now where um, everything's working great. We're making these great cards and, uh, you know, all the possible permutations in one box are pretty impressive. I mean, right. to do 32 by 32 in one form factor like this right. Right, is pretty impressive. Yeah. So you can really mix and match those cards any way you want. Yes. So you could use the 8x8 input card yep. 
combine that in the second slot with a 16 output card, so yes. you'd have eight inputs and 24 outputs. Yep. So if you're doing summing or running through a, a console, you can have all those outputs that you want. Or conversely, you can go the other way. Yes. So you could have 24 inputs and eight outputs yes. if you're not doing a summing type of a situation. And then the slots, one of the slots can then have eight microphone preamps installed Correct. into it. So you could have eight by eight or 16 by 16 inputs and outputs yes. and still have eight channels of mic preamps. Of mic preamps. Which also gives you insert points then, correct? The, yeah, it gives you in real-time inserts for the mic pre, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can use a little uh, studio trick by looping some of the outputs back in, and then if you go back out, it'll go back through the mic pre, t uh, mic pre circuitry, leave it at zero dB, and you can do real-time inserts, as okay. opposed to using a patch bay. Right. Um, yeah, and those configurations you're talking about are amazing, because, you know, I like to um, talk about this um, first family is the 8x8 family, which is, you know, I'm going to mm -hmm. do 8x8 and then maybe 16x16 16 16 max and 1. But you, you talked about one that I love, which is the 24, right? Mm -hmm. And because of the 16x16, 16 16, um, of course, we could do 32 in, 32 out, but also for a little bit less money than that much analog, you could do 24x24 24 24 with 8x8 digital, right. right? And, of course, we just talked about our new 8x8 our new card that has switchable AES and also... Um, ADAT optical, right, right, which is great. It's going to make that easier to put it together. But to me, that's a really wonderful box because 24 and 24 out is historically a very interesting number. Right. But it's a really balanced um, uh, tracking I.O. box because it gives you 24 and 24 out plus the 8x8 need of digital if you need it. Right. right. And then again, the one you mentioned before that I find is also popular in our paddock of people sending stuff out is the 24 in, 8 out, which mm -hmm. is a classic tracking box, right. right? And that, you know, that's, you know, you can do up to 32 by 32 in one box or variations within that. And then to go beyond that, right, you have multiple units, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, which would probably lead to the next thing, which are the modes, right? Because, right. um, you know, after you put the analog section together and you put together your great, you know, uh, you know, multiple input output analog box or whatever configuration specifically for your studio, mm -hmm. the, probably the best thing about the Symphony is how flexible it is, right? Okay. And um, it connects to everything is mm -hmm. one way to look at it. And the fact that it's really four interfaces in one. Generally, when you buy a high-end interface, it's specifically modeled to one solution, right? right? And then sometimes when you have to buy these, you have to specify that solution. Mm -hmm. So if you have um, needs that are USB and or standalone and or, you know, via another PCI architecture or via Pro Tools HD or HDX, you need specific interfaces for each one, when right. in fact, this is four. So um, right now in our new release, 4.2, um, this now emulates a Avid HDIO. Okay. So it's an HDIO. So when Pro Tools HD or HDX sees this, it sees this as an HDIO. So mm -hmm. it's a Pro Tools interface. Inversely, it could be on another um, Mac Pro Tower system with our Symphony 64 card, right? Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is actually accelerated. So the reason we get such great performance out of that card is there's acceleration on that card, hence why we get such great latency performances on this. Mm -hmm. And then and then it can be in this mode, running with any other DAW, Pro Tools. You, know, you can run Pro Tools to our Symphony 64 card or Logic or Digital Performer okay. or any of the great DAWs out there will run in that mode. And probably the most exciting mode from a flexibility standpoint is USB. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, you know, I know that USB has got phenomenal in one of the revisions of Snow Leopard, and uh, we get great performance out of USB now, and uh, we, we, only, we limit it to 16 by 16, right? Okay. But still, right, and I know you've experienced this, it yeah. works really well, right. and then the last mode you can put it on is standalone mode. So if you're in another studio that has maybe subpar conversion, Right? Mm -hmm. You can put this in standalone mode, get into it digitally, but still use these converters. And the cool thing is that's all simply done by just, by just holding down this mode, and then you just switch this. So I'm going to put it into symphony mode, and I just collect it. It's going to reset the machine to symphony mode. Of course, we don't have one hooked up, but it'll come back on. So there it goes. It resets, mm -hmm. and then bang, now it's in symphony mode. Right. right. So phenomenally flexible. Right. And and how I talk about that is, you know, in the morning it could be in a Pro Tools HDX studio. Mm -hmm. I can then take it over to the writing suite where they might be using Symphony 64 and Logic, right? And then we can then take it out on the road with a laptop and Pro Tools, capture 16 channels of audio in the field, right? right? Then go to somebody's house where it's PC based, hook it up in standalone mode, and then take all that material back to the Pro Tools HDX studio in one day. Right. And in fact, you were telling me earlier, you could actually have this hooked up to Pro Tools 
or the symphony card and have it hooked up to a second computer by USB and switch between them. Well, you could switch between them. And in fact, when you're running Pro Tools with this, um, since uh, Pro Tools doesn't send some command structures down the PC32 cable, mm -hmm. right? This is how we actually configure this. Uh, when you're in Pro Tools mode, you have to have it hooked up via USB. Right? Okay. So that's how Maestro will boot and how you'll calibrate this. The calibration on this is fantastic. Right? It's so easy to do. It's all software-based, no screwdrivers needed. Mm -hmm. right? Kind of wonderful. Right? But then in, at that same time, w what I realized is that I could then launch another app on that computer, switch it to USB mode, and have the other app play back at the s while it's all hooked up, fine. Nice. Right? So it's kind of a cool thing nice. about the box. That's amazingly right? flexible. Yeah, very flexible. I, you, you, you could have, actually at that point in time, you could also have another system hooked up digitally and go to standalone mode. So you can have four things hooked up to it simultaneously if wow. you wanted to. That's right? pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. Right. So I had actually this unit, which we have configured as with an 8x8 yep. I.O. card, and it also has an 8-channel preamp in it. Yes. And we took it into Sweetwater Studio A and uh, did uh, a recording of two acoustic guitars doing improvisational music, and we used eight microphones, so we had some room mics, we had some things going on there, recording at 96K mm -hmm. uh, straight into a MacBook Pro using USB. Yep. And the performance is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, the sound quality of the preamps is excellent. Yes. They're very pristine. They're, they're nice and neutral, natural sounding with good presence to them, a lot of detail. Yes. And, of course, the converters are exemplary. Yes. I mean, you, you can't question, yeah. question that quality. But the other cool thing about it is there, there are two headphone jacks on the front. Yes. And you can address those independently. Absolutely. So we had two players. So we could create a separate mix for each of those two players and uh, each have their own volume control and, uh, and work with it that way. So it really was a one-stop solution, plug it into the MacBook, and uh, all our mic preamps, everything are right here in this one box. It was a very convenient way to do those sessions. It worked out really well. Yeah, no, and, 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 and that is, you know, really an example of the design that we did it this way. And the preamps are kind of interesting, too, because, you know, they're a little bit, when you look at them and you might look online and see how we do it, mm -hmm. it's really when you install them that the eureka moment comes because they're actually connected internally via ribbon cable. Right? So you have to have an analog card installed in order for the preamps to work. They don't offer you more input. Some people think they give you another eight right. inputs or something. They really partner with an analog card. But then once you do that, then you get this wonderful software control. Right? And mm -hmm. that's where the inserts come. So basically in Maestro, you can just say, yeah, on line input one, I want it now mic. And now I'm going to insert out to my API compressor to come back in and capture this stuff. Right. Wonderfully done that way. So it gives you these phenomenal preamps that are built in. And when you go into the field, right? That's something that's tough to do sometimes. I mean, yes. To carry eight mic pre's with you and the cost of really good mic pre's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's where this unit becomes. And, and again, we, with all deference to some of the vintage mic pre's out there, sometimes you just need eight, you know, 85 dB gain, clean pre's. Right. And probably the one thing that a lot of pros have noticed is that there's no transformers, but they're still incredibly warm and fat, and you can really push them Right, mm -hmm. and you don't get that bandwidth squish that you sometimes get with transformerless based preamps. Right, right. Yeah, they sound great. Well, it's an amazing box. Great sound quality. Like you said, it's modular, so you can configure it exactly the way you want yep. it for your studio or for your portable rig. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that flexibility, being able to use it with so many different systems and, and different software types and things, is really really wonderful. Excellent, man. Thanks for coming in. No problem. Appreciate Thank you giving man. us an overview on awesome, this. Awesome. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.